Hey, I'm Brett Larkin, and welcome to the Yoga Hacks podcast, where we make yoga so much more than just something we do on a mat. We're talking hacky ways to stretch and feel good in our daily lives, using yoga philosophy to solve everyday problems. Ultimately, this is about you wanting to live your best life and feel amazing in your body using yoga and meditation as a tool. It's time to get creative, time to have fun, and remember, you can always be stretching, you can always be centered, you can always feel great in your body. Let's jump in to this week's episode. Hey, so welcome everyone to this episode of the Yoga Hacks podcast. I have a special guest with me today who I'm really excited to share with you. That is Cassandra Reinhardt. Hi, Cassandra. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So what you guys may or may not know is that Cassandra also has her own yoga channel on YouTube. So she and I are kind of like two peas in a pod. I think we connected over, what video was it? Was it the quitting teaching yoga video when I was talking about... Yeah. Yeah. Like how to, how to balance like YouTube and teaching online. And she sent me a really thoughtful comment and then we started Skyping and we kind of became fast friends because we have a lot of the same struggles. Oh (laughs) yeah, definitely. Teaching on YouTube, teaching in real life, how to balance everything. And even if you're not a yoga teacher, right? I think that's the question for all of us always is how are we balancing everything we're doing and constantly shifting our priorities. So Cassandra's going to share with us at the end of the episode one of her own yoga hacks because she obviously uh, knows about my whole obsession with hacking yoga into your daily life. So she has her own special hack that I don't know about that she's going to share with us. So that's very exciting. Um, But first, I wanted to ask Cassandra some questions that I think are really relevant for all of us, which is, again, about how the practice affects our daily daily life, how we bring the practice into our life. So, Cassandra, my first question for you, and I love asking this question to everyone, but, you know, what really brought you to your yoga practice? And do you feel like you're the same person you were before you started doing yoga? That's as good, compared to now. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, I started practicing yoga about seven years ago or so, and I used to be a dancer. I did ballet since I was like three years old, um, and I loved it. So yoga was just something that I wanted to try to hopefully get a little bit more flexible and get a little stronger, because although I did ballet like religiously, I was never um, flexible. Like I was always the least flexible person in my class, and it was really hard for me to... Um, get that mobility and flexibility. So I figured yoga would be um, a good tool. And I started going to classes and I, I kind of stumbled into it slowly. You know, I don't really have that story that people have where they took one class and fell in love with it right away and it changed their life. Like it really took me a couple months of trying classes before I actually started to take it seriously. And it all had to do with me trying out different teachers which I think is really important when you're new to yoga or new to any kind of sport or physical activity is to... I so agree with you there. Sorry, I want to jump in because I want to make this a really clear point for a lot of our listeners because I feel like this is something that doesn't get talked about enough in the yoga community, which is the importance of really finding the teacher that resonates with you. And that means you might have to try six (laughs) different studios, Yeah, every teacher on the schedule, right? I think... A reason maybe a lot of people try yoga and then don't like it is because they just happen to go to the studio closest to their house, yeah. to the teacher that was like at the most convenient time, and they ended up not having that connection, and then they just write off exactly. yoga. So, mm-hmm. so I I love that you share that it was a slow development, but also that you were so willing to experiment and check out tons of people because I think if you approach it as this exciting thing. It's almost like dating or finding your soul. You know, you get to try all these different classes, all these different studios, make a big, fun exploration out of it. Then you're really going to end up eventually finding the, the, the practice, the style, the teacher that resonates with you. So did you eventually come to a certain teacher or studio kind of what was that turning point when you realized you were really into this I was pretty um I guess I was always very curious about the practice and the great thing you know what we have pretty unique um you know in North America is that we don't just have a yoga class we have 30 different kinds of yoga classes right there are so many styles and great developments out there 
So I kept looking at schedules and being like, oh, forest yoga, what's that? Yin yoga, what's that? What's vinyasa yoga? You know, because I was so new to it, I had no idea what they all are. So I was like, you know what? I'm pretty much going to try them all and I'll see what works. So it took a while and I was just doing it casually really. Um, and in the end, it wasn't really a style that I felt in love with. At first, I just really found a teacher that I connected with. So I started going to her classes a lot more and I was doing vinyasa, flow, hatha, and yin styles of classes, which is also what I still do today. Um, but yeah, so I had come to yoga because I was a dancer and I wanted to do something good for myself, get a little bit more flexible, get a little stronger. And one, what ended up happening is that I finally found myself in this environment where suddenly there was no competition and I was not being judged for my physical ability, which isn't something that I think is completely bad. Like I really did enjoy the competition and dance and I think it was, um, it was beneficial to me in a lot of ways. It helped me develop character. But at the same time, I was getting injured a couple times a year. You know, I was like 18 years old at the time and I was thinking, you know, it's probably not normal that I already have a bad back and bad knees <laughs> and bad hips. Like what's this going to look like when I'm 50, 60, 70, 80? And that kind of became a lot more important to me. Um, so then I kind of made that transition from ballet into yoga because I just fell in love with um, the wholesome aspect of yoga where I didn't really need to be harsh on myself or push myself past um, past my edge when it went into like a dangerous injury territory, which does happen a lot in ballet. You know, teachers are there to push you and you push yourself and there's always um, who's going to be the best uh, kind of mentality, right? And it was really refreshing. Oh, yeah. It was really refreshing to be in an environment uh, that didn't have that as much. Now, that being said, it took me, and I mean, this is still something that I work on today, but... I still have like that dancer's ego in me that will creep in every now and then and say, oh, well, she can do that. I can do that too, <laughs> you know, or you're always wanting to learn that next new pose that you think is like the best or something like that, you know, and I think that's pretty common when you're first beginning the practice, especially when you're dealing with athletes is they'll just look at the physical practice and they want to push and push and push. Um, so that's a struggle, but it's still been a lot healthier than uh, my dancing days, that's for sure. Yeah, and I think you're touching on something that, again, is really relevant for our listeners, which is how do you strike that balance between athleticism and pushing yourself mm -hmm. to go further and practice a little harder, or do a few more chaturangas, yeah. and listening to that voice that's saying, you know, I just need to do yin today, and I just need to completely take care of myself, and how much is ego and how much is not. I mean, I know for myself in my own practice, and again, I don't feel like this is something that really gets talked about enough, but that's something I'm always struggling with. You know, I yeah. want to get the workout. I want to push myself to get the workout at the same time. Deep inside, I'm just thinking I want to lie in a yin style yeah. forward fold for 40 minutes. And when is that starting to become lazy? You know, because I probably would feel better if I did some sun salutes and actually worked out. And when is that a voice I really need to listen to? I mean, that's something I'm so interested in. And I'm wondering what you tell your students or just any of your own wisdom on that just to share with everyone. You know, I've also spent a lot of time thinking about this and kind of um, wondering where this all comes from. And it would be easy for me to just blame it on the dancer athlete mentality of pushing yourself. But I think it goes a lot deeper than that, where I think for me, it was very um, insecurity based. So whenever I thought I needed to push myself, and even today when I'm feeling like I can do that extra chaturanga or I should be better at my handstands or, you know, I'm trying to push myself, I have to ask myself, am I doing this because I'm feeling insecure or am I doing it out of love because I feel strong, because I have the energy to burn, because I know this is a challenge that I can greet with open arms or is it because I'm feeling kind of bad about myself? I feel like other people are better than me. I'm insecure about myself and I feel like I have something to prove, right? Mm, I love that as using the insecurity as a checkpoint, right? And that's, that's hard. Like that's a hard mm -hmm. question to ask and it's a harder question to answer because no one wants to be – like I know I never like to answer, yeah, you know what, I am being insecure because I don't want to think about myself that way. But the reality is is if I'm not being mindful and not paying attention to how I'm really feeling deep down, 
I will risk pushing myself too far. I will risk injuring myself and it won't make me feel any better, you know? I'll just end up exactly where I was before. So it's um right. it's hard, but it's a very worthwhile practice, I think. Yeah, and I think this is a great message too for any beginners or people who are just kind of starting their yoga journey here because here are two yoga teachers talking and we still have all these issues. I mean, right before this call, I went to a class at one of the studios I teach at that's a hardcore power yoga studio. I was at the front of the class taking class. Another teacher was teaching and she did this pose called chin stand, which I barely have ever done. And it was weird because I was a teacher at that studio. Everyone else in the class, most of them knew me. They knew I also teach there, right? Because I was at the front of the room, even though I was just taking class as a student, I felt a lot of pressure to do the pose and try it. And I did. And in retrospect, if I had really been listening to my body, like I don't really feel like inverting today. Exactly. I'm having low back stuff. I just want to rest. So, you know, if you're starting your journey and you're finding yourself playing with some of these concepts, just know that it's a never ending process. All of us teachers are struggling with it too. And oh yeah, (laughs) um, it's an ongoing, ongoing thing. So um, Cassandra, I know one of the things we talked about and besides having YouTube, teaching, dance backgrounds, and everything else we have in common. I know another thing that you wrote to me about that I think we also both have in common is yoga as helping us with our anxiety and helping us stay calm. So do you want to share with everyone a little bit more about um, that in terms of just how the practice has affected your day-to-day life? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yoga and just mindfulness as a whole has probably had the biggest um, effect on my mental health and my general state of well-being. Um, I was definitely that worrier as a child and in high school I had a lot of anxiety and it manifested itself the most in me uh, when I tried to go to sleep at night. Like I don't remember ever falling asleep in less than two hours every night before I went to bed, you know, and I, I always thought that's how everyone was. I didn't think that I I had anxiety. I just figured everyone is like this. Everyone goes through lists over and over in their heads while they're trying to go to sleep. Everyone has to take two hours before they fall asleep, you know? And then it's only when I got a little bit older that I realized, oh my goodness, no, they don't. Some people actually just put their head on the pillow, go right to bed. (laughs) Some people don't worry about what's going to happen next week or next month or, you know, next year. Um, So that was a bit of a shock to me to actually identify that what you know, what I thought was normal behavior was not, you know, and that there was another way to be. And so once I kind of identified that, I really did not want to be that person anymore. I wanted to see what it was like to actually be the kind of person who could live in the moment, who did not need to worry all the time about what was to come. And I found that I didn't really need to work to make that happen. I just had to stay consistent with my self-care practices. So it wasn't like an effort of like, okay, starting today, I'm not going to have anxiety, you know, because that's not really how it works. Or starting today, I'm going to fall asleep in 10 minutes. Like, you know, I wish, but that's not the reality. Um, So I just started practicing yoga on a regular basis, which was Uh, very important to me. So to me, a regular consistent practice is about six times a week. And that's different for everyone. It could be once, twice a week. Um, But I found six was really, really helpful for me. And I started doing it in a way where I was not trying to prove something to everyone. I was really practicing to honor my body and how I felt and what my energy levels were. And I would incorporate a little bit of meditation in that, which was really, really helpful. That's great. And when you talk about also self-care practices, which I love, would you be willing to share with us what that looks like right now for you in terms of how what your self-care practice is, whether this is something you're doing daily or weekly or a combination? Well, yeah. So when I was just first starting off on this journey um, of practicing self-care in order to reduce anxiety, something that I would do a lot whenever I would have a worry pop into my head, no matter how unrealistic it was, I would actually, instead of, you know, ruminating on it and going over and over on it, because the longer it stays in your head, the more dramatic it tends to become, at least for me. So whenever I had that kind of worry pop up, I would make myself write down, I would say, what is the worst that could happen? And then I'd write it down. 
what is the best that could happen? I'd write it down. And then what's the most likely to happen? And that kind of made me feel um, a little bit in control because I think that's at the basis of anxiety is you feel like things are not in control. So you worry about what could happen, right? You worry about the worst. And I felt that just the little simple exercise of putting pen to paper and just writing worst case scenario, best case scenario, and most likely scenario. I felt like I was prepared for whatever would happen. And then I could say, you know what? I'm ready. I can put this away and I won't think about it anymore. And I did that for a very long time. Um, Thankfully, I kind of have my anxiety under wraps now, so I don't really have to do that. But I'll do it mentally sometimes if I feel flustered or overwhelmed as I'm juggling a ton of things, you know. I will kind of. That's really cool. Yeah. Because even though you don't come to a conclusion in writing it down, or at least in your way of doing it, I mean, you still don't know the outcome, right? Yeah. But you've kind of assessed the different levels of what could happen and just making that assessment is somehow calming itself in the practice of doing it. I feel, is that kind of what you're, you're saying? Yeah, it is. Because I found that if I just keep the worry in my head to myself, um, there's really no way for me to present to prevent it from spiraling and making my worry a lot more dramatic than it really would be or should be. And it's very hard to kind of put the brakes on it and say, you know what, it's time to stay in today and the now and not really focus about all these potential outcomes. So to just write it down and then I would write it down and it was gone. That was it. And that really helped me a lot for sure. I really found to myself writing down things and I would do it in my iPhone because it was yeah. always, always with me. I'd start lists in Evernote and I could even open up my phone right now, but I went through periods and I should probably do separate podcasts even on these topics, but I went through a period where I was trying to eliminate judgment from my thoughts. Mm. Um, and I also was trying to eliminate actively shame. Right. Um, and what I would do in trying to eliminate those things, which sounds again, very counterintuitive, but anytime I had a judgmental thought, I'd write it down in the, in my Evernote on my iPhone. And there is something about writing it down. I think it just helps us become more aware of the fact that we're having these thoughts and at a certain point, it would just be ridiculous. Like exactly. the same thing. I'd be like, I feel bad. I didn't call my mother earlier today. I feel bad. I haven't done this. And then, like at some point, you're just like, this is so boring. Yeah. To 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 write down and to read, <laughs> it just becomes funny. At a yeah. certain point, you're just like, mind, you're hysterical. Because Stop. you're confronted by it. You know, you're confronted with what your worst case scenario really is, and then you kind of look at it and you're like, so what? You know, like I'm worried I'm gonna fail my test. Well, worst case scenario, yeah. I fail it. Best case scenario, it goes fine. Most likely scenario, I keep with the same grades I've always had, you know? And that worst case scenario of, oh my God, I'm going to fail my test. So what? You know? And that's a tiny little worry, but they plagued me. They plagued my existence. And I didn't just have one worry a day. I had a hundred that were just like this. So to actually just write it down really gains, I think it helps you get a little bit of perspective. Um, And I think voicing to other people would have the same effect, but I wasn't really in a space where I was ready to bring in other people in my little anxiety world because I was still coming to terms with it. So for me, pen and paper was the easiest way to do it. But I think if you can just tell a friend, you know, this is what I'm worrying about and you can just voice your judgments or voice your fears, it'll really help put it into perspective and kind of alleviate some of the anxiety that you're feeling around it. Yeah. So for others who are listening to this, if you struggle with anxiety, I think our big tips are kind of, I'm trying to synthesize just everything I'm hearing, but is to, you know, take a pen to paper and start recording your thoughts and then see what works best for you. I mean, what might work best for you is sort of Cassandra's approach of the best, worst, most likely. Maybe it's something more simple where you're just writing down a certain thought, sort of like I did anytime I had a thought that was a judgmental thought. I wrote that down. Mm -hmm. Anytime I had a thought where I felt bad about myself, I wrote that down. And then another third tip I'd like to throw in there, and Cassandra, let me know what you think about this one. But one thing I read that's really interesting, which I think is a Jack Hornfield principle, which is giving your the different voices in your head's names kind of like characters like the wounded child or like Miss Worrywart or, you know, you can have fun with it. But That was also helpful to realize that, no, there are these different personalities 
kind of in my brain controlling me Definitely. that aren't me, that I don't have to listen to. You know, I'm not this scared, worried kid anymore. I'm not this, you know, judgmental trait that's in my family yeah. anymore. You know, these are, these are characters, these are voices, and kind of seeing them as characters help me really identify them super quickly as not being my voice. So also going through an exercise where you, you know, write stuff down, but also start to be like, hmm, what character is saying this? You can yeah. kind of just start to break some old habits, I think. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, it, it all comes down to uh, mindfulness, really, right? So what is truly me or what is just ego and fear and all this And our crap. family and our <laughs> yeah. lineage. Yeah, like just all, all this, this stuff baggage. that's been ingrained into you, right? Exactly. Totally. So um, – so let's move on. I, hopefully we've given some, some practical tips to folks, but um, I know you put together some tips and some actual, like an actual yoga hack of your own to share with us. So I know you had a tip about yoga mats and you admitted to me that you own 12 yoga mats, which is <laughs> a problem. Really, really awesome. I think I have maybe seven in my house right now. My fiance is so angry about it. Um, He's always like, what? There's another mat? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but tell me, you were saying that you have a way that you actually use all 12 to get you practicing more. So you want to tell us about that? Yeah. So, I mean, most of the mats that I carry are in my car and it's kind of like my thing where I like to give them out to people. <laughs> like, hey, try yoga. Here's a mat. Now you don't have an excuse. <laughs> um, That's awesome. But for the other mats that I have, something that I've started to do, uh, I used to just keep it all in this room where I normally practice and film my videos just like in my house. It's like my own little, small little yoga space. Um, so I used to store all of my equipment there. And then one day I just decided, you know what? Like I'm going to take a couple of these mats and I'm going to scatter them around the house. So I have one in my living room and one in the basement. And then the rest is just like in the yoga room. Oh, and one in the bedroom. Because I found that, um, you know, when I'm not like working at my desk and stuff like that, I like to decompress on the couch with TV. I'm not afraid or ashamed to say it. I love television. <laughs> and... Um, it's okay. I've developed a whole course around stretching while watching TV, well, the yoga hacks course. So I'm not exactly. judging you. <laughs> but that's exactly what I would do, you know. Instead of like sitting on the couch and watching my shows, I would just peek over to the corner, see my yoga mat there and say, oh my God, wouldn't it be nice if I could stretch right now? <laughs> so I've, I've been able to start um, stretching and practicing yoga a lot more often just because I'm reminded of it more often because the mats are everywhere. So I really do like to stretch when I watch TV or to just get a little practice in. It's a really easy way for me to decompress um, at the end of the day. And it has significantly um, increase the amount of yoga that I practice on a day-to-day -day basis for sure. That's awesome. If I lived by myself, I would put yoga mats in every single room. <laughs> yeah. um, I think it's such a great tip. And then, oh, and sorry, before we move on, just what's your favorite mat right now? I have to ask. Um, you know what? I have one from a little tiny company that are based in British Columbia. They're just starting off, but they're called XR Size Yoga Mats. Um, and they're really cool. They're completely biodegradable, uh, completely, you know, like great for the environment and they're very sticky, but they don't have that harsh chemical smell that you get from like the Lululemon sticky mats. Cause I do have the Lululemon one that I use for a hot yoga. Um, when I go in a heated room, cause it is good for stickiness. I just can't stand the smell of it. Um, it's just so harsh. So this is another one now that I just got and I'm really liking it so far. Okay, cool. Say the name again. X or... It's X R uh -huh. size. Okay, cool. I'm gonna check it out. Yeah. I there's I just want to try them all. I am not a fan of Lulu mats. Um, oh no either, way. So no, no. I, uh, I yeah, I agree. I think they smell weird. Oh yeah, and, they smell yeah. super weird. But I do like them for hot yoga. Very hot. Little that's little okay. Mat. That's interesting. Yeah, like my other little mat that I like because um, I travel quite a bit, so I like to have a mat. Like I normally practice with a pretty thick mat because I like the cushioning on my knees and stuff like that. But when I'm traveling, that doesn't really work for me. So I have actually just like this little mat from Chapters that cost me seven dollars, and I can roll it up into a tiny little ball, small enough to put in my purse. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's really, really, really handy for travel for sure. Never leave without it. All right, cool. So will you tell us now about your own yoga hack? Yes. Um, 
Okay, so my biggest, maybe my biggest challenge, I'd say, in the whole yoga world, uh, meditating has always been very difficult for me. I try to do it very often, um, but I really struggle with it. My mind wanders easily, so I found that um, I enjoy guided visualizations a little bit more, but I've been wanting to move away from guided visual visualizations to a, I don't know, like a proper meditation practice of complete stillness and quiet. So it was pretty daunting for me to, you know, have a meditation session and put a timer and all that. Like it, it just seemed too much work. So what I've started doing, and it's been really beneficial for me, every time, because I drive to work in the morning, so every time I get in my car, before putting the keys in the ignition, I take five minutes to just close my eyes, breathe, and that's my meditation. And that's it. You don't even really need to call it a meditation if you don't want to because I think that makes it maybe a little bit more daunting. I'm just centering and preparing myself for the day in complete quiet stillness and I find in the morning I can relax a little bit easier and that's it every single morning and somehow I find that traffic doesn't bother me as much and I'm much happier when I get to work. This, I find this amazes me. So I have so many questions about this. Okay. So are you sitting cross-legged or do you just sit in your car? No, nope, I'm just style? sitting in my car seat the normal okay. way. And then do you set a timer on your, like, do you use an app or your phone to set a little timer or you just sit for, you just time it kind of yourself and let it happen naturally? I usually do it myself unless I know that I have a meeting that I have to get to and like I really need to be time conscious and then I will put the little timer on my phone um, or I have like a little meditation app. I can try to look to see. Is it Insight Timer? I yes, that yes, one. that's what it is. Yes. Yeah. Everybody get Insight Timer. It's free. It's great. Yeah, it's really, really good. So if I'm if I know like I have to stick to a schedule and not, you know, accidentally doze off or something or meditate too long, then yeah, I'll use that app. But otherwise I just kind of let myself do it for as long as feels appropriate that day. Sometimes it's a minute and sometimes it's fifteen. But on average it's five to six minutes and that's all I need to kind of just get cent centered and prepared for my day. And do you practice a mantra or do you practice just ujjayi breathing in and out the nose or are you doing some kind of pranayama breathing technique? I mean, or is it just my simple in and out breaths? Yeah, I try not to focus too much on my breathing because I find that when I do that, I start to think a lot or too much. You know, then it all becomes about what I'm doing and what I'm thinking about. And, you know, my goal with meditation is to actually just clear my mind completely. So I find that what works best for me is to just breathe normally and very naturally. That way I don't have to worry about it. And all I do is I close my eyes and I find it really helpful to kind of, I don't know how to explain this, but I kind of look at the back of my eyelids, you know, you can just like stare into that dark space and it mm -hmm. helps me really tune everything out. And you just relax. Yeah. Yeah. And I just relax. And I mean, I always get pulled away by other thoughts, but I just acknowledge it and come back, you know? So I think that's, um, that's something that people should know about. If you're new to meditation, it's going to take a while. <laughs> you know, it's a work in progress and it's not supposed to be perfect. It's not supposed to be I close my eyes and my mind is blank for the next 30 minutes, you know. I find that I spend most of my time in meditation coming back to stillness. Just always catching myself deviating away and getting caught up in thoughts or feelings and just coming back to my breath in the present moment and relaxing. And that's so normal. What I find so yeah, no, that's such a great point. And I think what I find so fascinating about this is that doing it in the car just seems so cool because to me, getting in the car means you're going somewhere. It's like you're already in a rush. You're already, yeah. Any anytime I get in the car, it's like the keys in the ignition, I'm going, you yeah. know, because either I'm late or I need to be somewhere at a certain time. So I think it's a very cool thing that you're doing it in the car. And obviously you have a job where... This is my next question. So do you have a job that you can kind of get in at any time or do you plan your morning so that you have so much buffer time that you can do this and hit traffic and everything is kind of okay? Um, I have a pretty flexible schedule. I don't have to be at work at, you know, exactly 9 a.m. or anything like that. But that being said, I'm always at work at 8 
I never really do stray from that. Um, I, I am a creature of habit. I do really like routine. So I like to get up at the same time, go to bed at the same time. That's another great tip if you have anxiety is maintain your routine, you know. Um, so I find that even with this little meditation practice, I never really stray too far from when I have to get into work. And it's not really work. It's not an effort. It's not something I have to plan because I found, I found that that was daunting about meditation. It's like, okay, well, when am I going to meditate? You know, when am I going to take 20 minutes? And it's like, I can take five minutes in my car because I'm already in my car anyway. Five minutes is not really going to make that big of a difference in my schedule, but it's going to make a huge difference in how I feel that day. So it was an easy choice. Yeah, and it sounds like you've kind of started your morning so early that you have that time, you have that luxury. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something I really want to work on because I there there are a few times in my life, I'm like, I can count them on one hand. No, just kidding. But there are times <laughs> in my life where I've shown up to something really early and it feels amazing. Awesome. You yeah. know, you're just like, yeah. I can relax. I'll go grab a chai. I'll come, you know, I'm not rushing in the door. Yeah. And it's really funny when you have that to think, why don't we cultivate and create that for ourselves more often? Because it's a very proactive choice and thing you can do, you know, yeah. just get up earlier, leave earlier. And it's something I really want to work on. And it seems like, you know, you're definitely, definitely on top of it with that, with that sense. Cause I, when I think about doing that in my own life, I personally don't drive to, to work like you right. do every day. That's just not my schedule. But I would imagine that I'd always be worried about time and worried about being late and worried about, you know, so I just think it's really admirable and cool that, that you do that. And I'm so glad that you shared it with everyone. So, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so Obviously, everyone, Cassandra has her own yoga channel on YouTube, so you can practice and do classes with her just like you do with me, mm-hmm. and you can find her on YouTube. What is your username? Just so everyone knows it, obviously, I'll p- post links to, to your website and everything uh, below below the podcast, but just why don't you let us know just where we can find you, and then I know you have some of your own courses and things that you Um, are selling. And so I'd love for you to just tell everyone about that in case they're interested. Sure. So they can access all of my information um, on YouTube. They can find it at Yoga with Cassandra and it's Cassandra with a K. Um, And same goes for my website. It's yogawithcassandra.com. So every Thursday I upload a new free class on my YouTube channel. So I have one coming in a couple weeks. I like to post um, beginner, intermediate, and advanced classes. And I do usually two styles. They're either vinyasa flow or yin yoga classes because I really, really love yin yoga. And same, I have a couple of online courses that people can go and purchase if they're really feeling it. Um, I have one for weightlifters, which I'm really, really excited about. I really like working with athletes just because that's my background. So I like to um, cater for them. So I have packages for weightlifters and for runners. And then I also have a chair yoga course and a yin yoga course online. Awesome. Well, we share so many common interests because I also love yin deeply. Um, so it's really fun to chat with you and hopefully we can have you on the podcast again because I feel like there are so many topics we could have gone even deeper on, but I think hopefully we did give people some really good tips for anxiety and just some simple things to do, whether it's in the car or hoarding yoga mats yeah. and putting them all over your house. I mean, I like wish I could do that. Um, that that's really helpful. So Everyone, thank you so much for listening. And Cassandra, thank you. I will see you on YouTube and talk to you next time. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening and joining me all the way to the very end. Make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube channel. You've downloaded my app full of free yoga classes that also has episodes of this podcast right in the app. Jump over to brettlarkin.com, get my free 18 days of awesome yoga jumpstart if you haven't done that already, and start integrating stretching into your day-to-day routine for real. It always be stretching.com. Remember you can tweet to send requests or questions about the show to at Larkin yoga TV. And it would mean so much to me if you shared this podcast with a friend. 
Since you're here with me till the very, very end, I also wanted to invite you to join my private Facebook group where I talk about hacking yoga and meditation into my daily life and give you ideas on how you can do the same, sharing things that I usually just don't feel comfortable putting on YouTube or my public page. Just go to yogahackscommunity.com, all one word, yogahackscommunity, and click request access to join. Until next time, remember, always be doing yoga, always be stretching. So many of you have told me that you spend so much time sitting at a desk and you want to get more stretching and yoga into your day. What if I told you you could be stretching an additional 90 minutes a day without changing anything about your day-to-day routine? I designed this course with you, my YouTube audience, in mind. If you're ready to go deeper and take your yoga practice off your mat and into your daily life, I invite you to join me for my Always Be Stretching Yoga Hacks course. You are really going to be able to apply this information into your daily life and into your routine in a way that no other course is really gonna enable you to do. With me, you'll tour my home, and in 10 exclusive videos, I'll show you the dozens and dozens of hacks that I use so I'm always stretching, gaining flexibility, and constantly feeling good in my body, regardless of whether or not I make it to a yoga class. I'll ship you my five favorite yoga props that support this hacky at-home practice. I also include six 20-minute stretching routines focused on key problem areas that you guys have told me you have. Upper back, low back, shoulders, core, all using the props that I've shipped you. So these classes are deep and different than anything you're going to experience with me on YouTube. And don't forget, this course includes direct access to me through a private Facebook group just for people taking this course. Occasionally we hop on the phone and I answer questions about the props. I tell you about new hacks that I've developed. I just want everyone to stretch their body and feel good all the time. 